Uh, so, hello, I'm James. Um, I did actually go quite a well while before introducing myself. Um, and I am a local resident in Horsham. Um, I'm a software engineer. Uh, until recently, I worked a non profit in London uh, called the Open Data Institute. Um, I am a parent and um, also I'm a bit of an activist, I suppose. I've always been involved in uh, and interested in using technology to make a better world. So I've worked in things like uh, climate change, um, various other bits and pieces like that, and more recently I've been getting interested in democracy. So I'm going to talk this evening for about 40 minutes, probably ish. Um, and then we'll do, uh, I think then we'll have a drink, break for a drink, and then uh, some questions, and then we'll open it up for more general discussion because it's politics who doesn't like talking about that or something. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about democracy. The, the, uh, the title that, uh, that they came up with is The Future of Democracy, which is quite exciting. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about democracy, about what uh, I've been doing in that area, the experiments that I've been doing, putting those experiments into practice, and then getting a little bit into how democracy is going to be affected by the changes in the world over the last few years um, and when we go from here. So, let's start. R0, zero. democracy. I've added this one in because I have my one, and I could be bothered to renumber them all, but all good things should start at zero. So, democracy, who knows what democracy is? Um, so, history lesson. Uh, invented, apparently, in about 5th century BC in Athens. Um, this is the sort of first thing that we think of as a democracy. Um, but it was quite different to what we have now. It's a much more um, it's very different uh, society, different size, um, things like that. So um, it was only adult male citizens that could uh, that could take part, uh, which ended up being about thirty percent of the population were people who were um, citizens, uh, i.e., not slaves, and also male and all the rest. So it wasn't exactly a universal franchise, but they thought it was obviously because uh, slaves were nobody really wanted people or something. Um, but that put it at around 50,000 people that were involved. It was very much a direct democracy. So um, all of the decisions, legislation, things like that were taken in a, in a very collective way. People could turn up, vote on them, get involved however they wanted. Um, which is very, very different to, uh, to what we do now, obviously, because we don't deal with many, many more people. Um, and how democracies evolved over the years. Um, one of the other things that they did is rather than, so they didn't do but we think of elections as an essential part of democracy. They didn't really do that. Uh, instead, they used uh, a very terribly low quality um, <laughs> a uh, process called sortition, which we can think of more easily as jury systems, basically. So, random selection of systems to do a certain, uh, a certain job, take a certain decision, things like that. And so, they place their democracy much more around uh, direct and around uh, this random selection idea. So then we fast forward a while, and this little quote, which I quite liked, um, by Thomas Hobbes in Leviathan, um, and it is a commonwealth in which the representative of the citizens is an assembly by part, but it's a system in which only a small part of the population represents the government. Yeah, slightly odd wording because you know, it's written a long time ago, but what does that sound like to you? That sounds quite a lot like our system, where you've got a few people um, doing that. But what he was talking about was not democracy, though. what he was talking about was aristocracy. You know, they were ruled by the best, which is really what aristocracy is. And interestingly, the ideas in our, that we think of as core to our current democracies really didn't start out that way. So things like uh, the US, we think of as, you know, sort of founding the stone of, uh, of democracy in the US and France in that sort of era. Um, early on, it was referred to as an aristocracy. It was a selection of the best people to govern. It wasn't ruled by all of the people. And the word democracy was really only used later on to describe it. And of course, it wasn't for everyone. It was for rich, uh, white male landowners, um, who probably still run it now. So, it's not as simple as saying, okay, this is democracy. Democracy is a whole range of things. It's a whole 
different set of, of concepts and types of, uh, types of ideas. So what we have is a representative democracy, uh, where we elect a representative and they go off to, uh, to do things for us, which <laughs> makes a lot of sense when you have to send them a long way on a horse or something like that, or all the way across the states, for instance. It's, you know, it makes sense. <laughs> One of the, I, I mentioned one already, and the next one is direct democracy. So this is the idea that everybody can have a vote on everything. Which maybe, if you're 50,000 people in Athens, and it's a very long time ago, maybe that's okay. Because, I don't know, maybe you enjoy that kind of thing. Um, these days there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of decisions, and you know, the world is big and complex, and we're all busy, and who would like to get involved in a direct democracy and take every decision for themselves? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Um, but that idea of, of, of giving everyone the choice, of everyone the vote, is still powerful. So we move on to some other ideas, things like liquid democracy. And liquid democracy is kind of a, uh, a direct democracy system where everybody can get a vote. But where basically what you get is you have a system in which you can get a vote recommendation from people you know, people you trust, uh, things like that. So if you trust somebody to look at a particular topic, they can recommend that you vote a particular way, and that's sort of a liquid democracy. So very much kind of, you know, what you said. Um, and then beyond that, you've got delegative democracy. And, and delegative and liquid democracy are, are really, um, are often confused, but they're, they're subtly different. The idea of delegative democracy is actually I delegate my vote to someone else in a very flexible way. So, I might say that as well, Peter knows a lot about, I mean, what do you know a lot about? <laughs> a lot about that. Um, and that she can have my vote on that topic. Or she might decide that I know about technology and she might give me her vote on that topic. And you end up with these sort of flexible clusters of, of, uh, of trust and vote delegation. And in a way, what we have now is a subset of this. We just all choose to delegate all our votes on all topics to one person for five years or two years depending on whether they get bored or not. Um, but very much, you know, just kind of give you a vote to someone else and off they go and they do it. So those sort of ideas of, uh, of democracy that, are, that are, have been around for a very long time, but they're, they're also gaining more currency now because we realise that actually our representative democracies aren't, we're not constrained in the same way that we were. So, the whole history of democracy has been about who counts, really. Who actually is allowed to vote. And it's not actually just the history of democracy, it's the whole history of everything. The whole history of power is about who gets to choose, who gets the information, and who do we listen to. And whether it's choosing an aristocracy, a democracy, a monarchy, a, you know, any, any number of other uh, systems. This is the question. And for the first time, because of where we are now, we get to the point where this could be everyone, if we wanted to be. So, this, you know, there's lots and lots of, of good ideas out there. You know, there's, there's lots of ideas that are in the, the party manifestos and things like that. But I know that out there there are a lot of other good ideas. There's loads and loads of good ideas that are from other countries that would work perfectly well in, for instance. But we tend to, to reinvent things. We don't think we have to solve the whole problem. Whereas there are good ideas everywhere, and maybe we're moving to a point where we can start to take advantage of that diversity of ideas. So, um, the thing that I've been working on is this idea of open source politics for the last little while. So, let's step away from democracy slightly and, and go towards politics, and they're kind of related and kind of different, and maybe really meant to be conflict anyway. Um, but let's talk about that for a while. So, like I said, I've worked in issues like climate change and, and other big things like that. And you, when you deal with those really big problems, you come up against really big blockers, really big problems. Um, and eventually, you keep going and you keep going and you hit politics. God, I can't solve anything because the world is a big fire. And, you know, it, it's all. I mean. <laughs> A brief run for a minute, we have to deal with actual Nazis again. It's it's insane, but it's right. We're taking that control, so that's nice. 
In the meantime, this isn't sinister at all. I love how they put this hands on their own things so you can see how big they are. It's really good. It's like what can you do to um, That's not, it's not terrifying, it's okay. All hail, all. Um, it's fine. Um, just the world is just. I've described it as a denial of service to on reality. I mean, who knows what's going on? Anyway. Okay. Right, my okay. case. <laughs> you get politics. This is a real picture of Michael Howard. He had this painted of himself and hung up in Paul Cullis' house. He chose that pose. I don't know what that says about him, but you know, some of them are really sinister. It's a really great um, picture collection on the Parliament website, all the art that happened. But, I mean, this one's hilarious, but one of Tony Blair makes him look like some kind of idiot. It's incredible. I mean, he must have approved it. It's, it's incredible. Anyway, this is not what they're talking about. <laughs> so everyone hates politics. It's just this soul destroying. And we spend a hell of a lot of time moaning about it. Um, and you realize that the political system that we have and the people that are in it have become a really big block of solving problems. On the other hand, I'm an engineer. I've worked in software development for 20 years, and I've loved working in, um, in an open source kind of way. An open source is this idea where it's not just that you can get something for free. The idea is that we can build the software together, collaboratively, I can work with somebody on the other side of the planet without knowing who they are, and work together to build something amazing. And our world runs on this thing. This has, this has changed the world underneath us without us really realizing it. The way of working together over the, uh, um, across the world to build things for the public good. And the, the most obvious project like this is, is something like Wikipedia. I mean, everybody knows what Wikipedia is now. Right? A few years ago, it was, oh yeah, there's just some new notes running inside Wikipedia. It would never be as good as a attacker or something like that. That's crazy talk. Um, yeah, I don't know where the are on now. It's probably shut or something. Nobody uses it anyway. Because actually, the error rate is high. The quality, because of the sheer number of people looking at something like Wikipedia, is much, much higher. Um, because, you know, many, many, many eyes on something make all of the problems disappear. Many eyes make all bugs shallow, is the, is the phrase. And horrifying pictures aside. I, I love that idea of collaboration. I love that idea of working together to solve those problems. Um, and uh, there's a particular platform that's, uh, that's very, very popular in the software development community called GitHub, which is a platform for sharing code, building code together, and provides a lot of tools and workflow around that stuff. And I've been using that for many years and it just has transformed my career. So, being an engineer, there's a thing that annoys me. There's a thing I really like. I wonder if I can fix one of those using the other one. Let's see what comes out and see what happens. So, that's weird. Um, so, in the middle of 2013, uh, I got frustrated and bored of just complaining about things and said that what we should do, we need a sort of weird group of people on the internet that I assumed existed, was that we should start writing down the ideas we have on how to make a better future in one place, and we should start just collaborating on that in the way that we know how to do when we build software. Uh, so we did, we started writing a manifesto in an open source way, a bit like something like Wikipedia. Um, this is the thing, this is the Open Politics Project we started. Uh, you can find it at openpolitics.org.uk. Um, and the idea is we were building these, um, this, uh, this political platform um, just in the open, not attached to anything in particular, we were just writing down ideas, collaborating together. So, there's a few really nice things about the workflow that mean that this kind of worked. First of all, the very low barriers to entry. So, if we design things in the right way, you can be looking at, and this is a screenshot of the site itself, I'll actually show you the real thing. Um, you can, you know, you have a, a party manifesto there, recent sort of ones that we've seen falling apart today. Um, and there's a, there's a button at the top that says suggest a change. And you can just go and click the button and you can change it. And you can change it to what you think you should say. Using a fairly reasonably friendly interface, a lot friendly than it was. We all want to work on making it more and more.
works out to me. And, and then what happens is that that uh, change gets into this open review process, and here I'll actually show you the real thing. Um, <coughs> this is a quick example. Let me uh, do this. So, here we are. So, this is the real live thing, and we're doing the traditional real life things. So I've got a full master internet, probably. So we look at proposals that are open on the uh, on the thing at the moment, and that's interesting in your uh, your trading problems because oh, I've never ever done this. Never, never. Oh, okay. Right. So these are the proposals that are open at the moment. Um, the edits that people have made they stay open for about ninety days, and people vote and, uh, and so on. So actually, was the one that somebody added. Has to be open today, it's already got a couple of votes. Um, and it is to break apart the trade operator monopolies in local areas so that actually you have some competition, you have local monopolies rather than uh, competition, it's supposed to be about competition. So, some suggested way that they could, they could improve that. And uh, we can see who proposed it, we can see what they did, we get some discussion around it, and we get votes. And when it's been open long enough, and there's enough votes. Uh, in people go. So, the other nice thing is, given the system that we built it on, is uh, an idea of version control. So, somebody did a thing the other day where they looked at all of the Conservative Party manifestos for the last few years and they said things like, uh, not picking on the Conservatives, I'm pushing over this one thing, which was, I think, in 2010 it said they'll eliminate the deficit by 2015. In 2015 to 2017, in, no, hang on, I've got that wrong. Anyway, you get the idea. Now it's a um, And those things have changed over time. Over time. They, do that. they probably just did it last week when whoever it was wrote the thing and realised that I'm crashing the screen for people. But what we have is the ability to go back at any point in time and see exactly what was changed, when, where, by who, what the discussion was around it. So, you know, who put that? Who put the, uh, again, I'm picking conservative things, but that's just because of the news. Um, who put the social care uh, reform stuff in? Where did that come from? What was the discussion about? We don't know. But in our case, we did. It's all over. But actually, we can even go down into individual lines in the, uh, in the thing itself and see who changed the lines. It's exactly who was, uh, uh, who was to blame. That's <laughs> So I really like this idea. I wanted to do this with the actual part of the test all the time, but they're not very amenable to do that. But the really nice thing about this is that absolutely anyone can help. Anyone can get involved. You can all get involved right now on your mobile phones. It will work. Um, and this is actually really out of date because we are over 50 contributors now, and definitely over 50 others. So the whole thing's been written by, or contributed by, somebody by over 100 people. Um, there's an interesting bit of information given in here, which is these kind of abstract shapes are people who haven't had an account on, uh, on the system that we're using on GitHub before. So they're not developers, they're not technical people, they're not using that system already, so they're not familiar with it. They are just coming in just to do our thing. So we think that's quite a nice indicator that it is at least partially accessible, but we can always make it better. We want to actually make it so you can log in with other social media profiles and things like that. Um, so that's something for um, But yeah, we ended up with, you know, since 2013, it's now over 100 people. Um, you can download a PDF or an EPUB for your Kindle off the site, read it cover to cover, which I've done once. Um, surprisingly held together, which I didn't expect. Um, and it's, it's like 50 pages long. Yeah, it covers a load of things, and this is just built by these 50 people. Obviously, not more, more, but you know, most of these people I don't know. So, if you've got that, what do you do next? Like I say, we've got this. So, in about 2014, we had about 8,000 words of, uh, of policy. It's a lot bigger now, um, but it covers stuff across all these areas, from uh, from defence, military, to education, to health, to um, to all this stuff. It's not 
complete, everyone. It's you know, based on whoever was interested in a particular thing at the time, but it covers a lot of that. And there are some key ideas that are, that are in the ideas of openness, of transparency, of improving our democracy, taking those steps into the future of democracy with ideas like liquid democracy or derivative, and building a system suitable for the 21st century and taking on with big problems. But also with a very strong social conscience, very strong sort of progressive ideals. There is a, a sort of techno-libertarian view, especially around Silicon Valley, where the idea is that we can just encode the whole world in software and then you know, everyone will be fine because the world is simple and has nice clear cut rules. Um, I'm unsure if you're you know, rich and can afford to build your own private island off the coast of California, then that's fine. But it's not going to work for most people. So, the idea is that it is this technology enabled view, but with, this, with these progressive ideals. Um, so, what do you do if you've got a manifesto? Do you stand for election? Yeah. It's stupid. Well, among you, I just, I'm still using the same quote as the show. So I only have got one good photograph of myself. <laughs> I'll leave you to decide whether that's it. Um, so, this was 2015, as you can see. Um, I think there will be a 2017 version of this page coming out sometime soon, I guess, uh, because I've written a blurb for it because I'm standing again. Um, and I also stood in the council elections month ago. So standing in the council elections, I'll have to that for all of this year. Brilliant. Lovely. Stand for Holbrook in council elections. I know, we were just getting to the end of that. And that's, oh, by the way, there's another general election. Yay. That's great. It actually is quite great, because this is what we do, right? This is the whole point of doing this, is that we think that we need to get involved. So, anyway, I decided to stand. We actually formed a party uh, around that called Something New, and you can find us at somethingnew.org.uk. The manifesto itself is still independent. The party believes in the power of openness and collaboration so much that we don't own our own manifesto. It's owned commonly, publicly, by everyone. And that's quite a yeah, good, powerful statement of what we, what we believe. Um, and the idea is that this is a party that's putting across those ideas of, of openness and, uh, and so on for um, in the political realm. So, we did plastics. That's the last thing, the last one. Uh, that was good fun, surprisingly good fun. Um, I'm looking forward to. We did a uh, West Sussex Humanist one with the Skeptics as yeah. well, yeah. Uh, which was great. And we've got the next one um, in Brighton Road Baptist Church on the 31st. So come on to that. It's actually more fun than this sounds. And um, it's more fun than it sounds being up there as well. Um, so that's great. And you know, weird things start to happen, like somebody takes a photograph of the ballot paper with a cross next to it. <laughs> why, why is this happening to me? This isn't normal. Also, is that legal? <laughs> it is. It is legal. If you'd written his name on it, it wouldn't be. It's weird little things that you learn. So, the point is that we are not just, not anymore just mucking around on the internet trying to make some policy in an open source kind of way. We're actually standing people up to put that up in front of voters. Because what's the point if you're not going to do that? Um, this time around, uh, we have two candidates. We had two candidates last time, unfortunately, one was moving the house, so we couldn't stand. Um, but we do have two candidates again. We have me down here in the south, and we have a guy called Lewis, who's standing up in Ross Sky and Lockout, which is the country's largest constituency in the Highlands. Um, so, in a way, we're kind of making a sandwich out of the UK um, with a bit of a Shetland garnish on top and Northern Ireland side salad. Um, anyway. <laughs> I don't know what to say anymore. So, yeah, we are still going, we're still doing this, we're still building that movement and trying to look forward to pushing this out in future elections next year. It's the London elections and, and so on. So, we're, yeah, basically exploring what we do. <laughs> it's quite a lot, but it's, it's good fun. Um, so, yes, come June 8th, that's what I'll do. So, the next thing, I'm not going to dwell on that too much, I've talked about the sort of process of standard for election, 
and to the sustainable of the skeptics book, which some of you might have seen. I know you did, but it's forgotten, so that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, but if you're interested in the process and, and what happened and the story behind how I ended up studying the election in a bit more detail, then you can tell me about that. I think it's um, But what I want to talk about now is, is just going to more of the idea of actually where do we go from here. So these are the experiments that we've done, and there are other people doing experiments around the world. Where are we actually going? And one thing that something new believes is that the network itself, the internet, is bringing a huge change to uh, to our world and to um, and necessarily to democracy as well. And there's a huge appetite for change. There are people all around that care about the world, but they don't feel connected to the system we have, they don't feel heard. And we're getting used to being able to express ourselves more often, more regularly, um, and in more uh, different ways. And it was fascinating standing out in the street in the last election because some people came up to me and explained that they needed a better democracy. And before I'd said anything, they proceeded to tell me all about it. And then I said, well, there you go, we've got this. Because, yeah, it's in there. Um, so there is this, this kind of appetite for change. Um, but it's really important that this sort of idea of digital democracy, what can we do with democracy now in the digital age, is not just the 18th century system we have on a smartphone. It is not just making sure that your prime minister is on Twitter, where she can broadcast to you just as easily, and in fact, even more easily than before. Um, I'm not better this, that probably is a strong statement, doesn't it? Um, probably. Everything says strong statement. Um, so, it's not about that. It's not about a new broadcast medium. This isn't what the network is. The network isn't broadcast. It's not better television, better radio. And in fact, I don't think it's about digital democracy. It's actually just democracy. Yeah. Using now the tools and the technologies that we have to do democracy better. Most people get hung up on digital democracy. They use these new tools as I'm well. just going to talk about democracy really. So you've got to fix the general issues with that. So, as um, this is a, a diagram from a paper by a guy called David Reinfeldt, who wrote it in a date that I didn't write on one, but I'm sure uh, it's around time. It was sometime, I think, in the 80s or early 90s. Um, and he talked about the evolution of societies from uh, this sort of kinship based system, clans, tribes, very early. Human societies. Um, then, as we get bigger, we get more complex. We go up to the sort of hierarchical institutions like armies and, and churches and um, the sort of monarchy state type of things. This sort of rigid hierarchy. And then that starts to break apart. We get competitive markets, and that's sort of where we are now with a, a world dominated by a trade and commerce, sort of decentralized um, system. Uh, but still based on um, a lot of, but still with a lot of hierarchy within it as well. Um, but then he proposes that where we're actually going is moving towards these multi organizational networks because we're moving to break apart those hierarchies completely and end up in a, in a sort of connected way, almost sort of a directly connected way that we haven't been since the, sort of the very early days, empowered by. By the, uh, by the capabilities of networks. And this is sort of mirrored in ideas of uh, network design with sort of centralized, uh, centralized networks, like you know, there's lots of people and the government does everything. Um, or decentralized ones where okay, the government sort of you know, breaks apart uh, of a bunch of different agencies and you know, interoperate, but people still deal with them on a separate basis through to this fully distributed idea where actually. Yeah. We're all working together in mesh, and that seems to be kind of where things are going because this is the architecture of the net. And that architecture is starting to fundamentally change our society to match. And also at the same time, we are more, we're growing as a species. This is, uh, has anyone heard of the color shift scale? It's one of my favorite things. Um, so there was a Russian scientist called Karl I can't remember his first name, um, who said there were 
you can define this sort of scale of civilizations. So a type one civilization is one that uses all of the energy available uh, to its entire planet. Type two is one that uses all the available energy in its, from its star, all of it. And a type three uses all the available energy from the galaxy. Obviously we're not here yet. <laughs> <laughs> but we are approaching this. There are estimates that put us, probably fairly old estimates, but are probably further on, that put us at about 0.7 on this scale. And we're seeing that in the fact that we are becoming a global society. Um, a global system with global powers and global products that affect us all, no matter uh, what we do. Um, this is a diagram called the. Uh, what is it? The word is completely gone. It actually has completely gone. Anyway, it's nine things, <coughs> if I can remember the word, uh, that are um, limits to. So, there's quite a few novel entities. I don't know what that is, that's kind of things we just don't know about. Uh, ozone depletion, aerosol loading, ocean acidification, and any of these, if they get up to the red, would be a real major problem. These are global issues that are going to cause us serious issues. Everyone knows about climate change, it's actually just here. Uh, nitrogen and phosphorus prices are much worse, and they're going to look Doing all that so that's good, um, and we're not really dealing with things at this scale. But what we need to do is, is accept the fact that we're not just building a sort of new media of, of um, a, a better broadcast media. We're building a new kind of nervous system in a way, connecting us all together. And the debate and the chaos of the internet are part of that. I definitely think that you know the individual neurons in my brain are probably trolling each other and you know, calling each other terrible names uh, in their equivalent of whatever online forums they have. But out of the out of that comes something, uh, something else. So this is kind of where we're going. Certainly, where technology is taking us. The question is what we do with it. Whether we realise that and work with it, or whether we just you know, try and keep up. Twenty years later, like most of our uh, current political system to do it. And there are loads and loads of tools coming that are trying to look at democracy in that light. Things like represent, I'd highly recommend going to look at represent, I've got me. Uh, it's kind of a, um, a democratic system built for the internet. You get, anyone can get involved, uh, give your opinions, things like that. It's trying to get this idea of, um, of more feedback for politicians. And so there are lots of those things, um, better interactions, but we also need better choices that are built for this age. So there are new parties growing up around the world. There's Flux in Australia, uh, Podemos in Spain, uh, Partido de la Red in Argentina, um, and the Pirate Party, particularly in Iceland, where they were very, very nearly in power, which is amazing. Um, and we need to be looking at things like online voting and so on, not because it will increase turnout and get the kids voting for smart way to kill you. That's how you think if you're a politician who's been stuck in time residency for 40 years. It's just because that's where we live now. That's how we operate. And not realizing that's dangerous. Because what we've got at the moment is we've got this very industrial revolution kind of system working for us, and it's trying to deal with the issues of the 21st century. Um, and the kind of framing of politics that we have now isn't going to translate. So this is your kind of traditional left-right thing. It doesn't really mean anything anymore to anyone, because you'll find that most of these parties are split along all of the elements. So actually, that's not what they're representing. And someone um, friendly is in a uh, really interesting analysis on pop results are there. And, um, <laughs> to look at what the actual political axes of all were, in the country. And the only one they really managed to identify is the one they called the Axis of UK. Um, which is basically, to me, it seems to be, I and mean, it's related to the things we've seen with Trump and things like that, it's, it's sort of globalist versus localist, in a way. Do we want to be part of that big global society solving these big problems, or do we want to um, you know, put up the balls and deal with our own problems? Um, and it's that kind of outlook that seems to be one of the most dominant things, and all of the countries are split along that line. And I think the um, 
that's a real sign that they're not actually working anymore in the, in the age that we're in. I think what we've got is we've got new axes, like I say. So I think we've got things like, are we going to be competitive or collaborative? Are we going to work locally or globally? Are we going to work for individuals or for species? Are we going to be closed or are we going to be open? And, you know, the, we need to be building and designing a, or evolving our democracy into this world into this hyperactive world where um, there is a fundamentally new way of thinking and emerging. So this, and it's going to happen. Democracy is going to change in 50 years. It won't look like it does now because it can't. It just, people won't accept it. So who's going to do it? And it's a very slow change in each generation. But again, obviously I mentioned you have a mayor in Barcelona now, so it can happen quite quickly. They only appeared a few years ago. But this is a huge change, and with those big technological changes come big social changes, big democratic. So we're going to find new uh, democratic ideas emerging, new political ideas emerging in that age. And can our industrial era choices handle that future? I mean, I find it very hard to believe that Jeremy Corbyn said, we you know, face the task of creating a new Britain from the fourth industrial revolution powered by the internet of things and big data to develop cyber physical systems and smart factories. <laughs> Unless he read it off something. Um, <laughs> to be honest, I worked on that and I don't know what that means. <laughs> but I wouldn't put it quite like that. But it, it's, you know, can, can they understand these things? There was this idea in. Um, in business of, uh, of disruption, and there's a, a great book called The Inventor Star Network by Clayton Christensen. Um, we talked about disruption, why big companies can't change. When you see large companies getting driven out of the market for a long time and time and time again, it happens, it's happened for them. Because the big companies come in, they get a great big customer base, they've got a whole lot of people who like what they make, that's great. We've got to keep those people happy, otherwise, we start losing a huge amount of business. So we can't do anything different. So detraction comes from the outside. Um, and I think this is true of politics as well. And either as an outside force you can come in and uh, build support and, and whatever over time, or you can just show that things can be done differently. And so by doing everything that we're doing, by doing things in the open, we are saying, well, look, you can think differently about some of this. So, do we need new movements? I've probably covered some of these, but so a friend of mine said this, software is politics because software is power. Um, and as software engineers, I think that we have to, so there's a, there's a sort of civic technology movement, particularly here in the UK, to say, okay, we can build neutral tools that will work to engage with the data in the market, so we can give people information on who, what they're going to be voting for. We can expose their uh, details about their expenses, for instance, and uh, show who you can vote for, where you should go and vote. And give people more information. And we think of that as neutral, but actually it's not, because the core question of power is who has it? Who has access to information? And to give people in the current system who are quite happy that people don't actually know who the people are, or don't actually know where to vote. That's fine, because they're there. Why would they want to change? And because politics, I think, is about how much you to work together and, and openness and collaboration is our choice, our vision of how we can build that the future and how we can become this sort of collaborative, global, species level, open society. And what, we've, what we have to do for that is present this real vision of why that is better. What we get at the moment with a lot of politics, a lot of politics like management, right? It's like, what are we going to do? We're going to increase tax by the next percent. I don't know, make people sell their houses to pay for dementia care. Um, but what you won't hear from most politicians at the moment is why. Why are they doing that? Why, what is it they're actually looking at in the future? Where are they going? And this is a, a diagram from a talk by a guy called Simon Sinek, who again is talking about marketing and ads for companies about. You know, you can, everyone goes in talking about what, you know. Um, we have built a bigger MP3 player that now can hold 400 songs. That is what we have built, yay. And Apple come in and go, we, 
It's got to be a bit of a thing. We want to get names in. Right? They've, they've started with one. And he puts a lot down on it. But vision is important. We've lost vision. Uh, my old boss uh, used this slide in many of our company, you know, company papers. And it's basically choose your future. Right? Where do you want to live? What film do you want to live in? What sci-fi future do you want to be in? Do you want to be in Star Trek? A utopian technocracy? Where we all have everything we want. Basically, uh, communism. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. Not all of it. There's plenty of other things around, but anyway. Do you want to live in Blade Runner? Apparently, I have a lot. I don't know what that means. Um, it's always raining. And it's always raining. Who wants to live in Blade Runner? I can't want to go see Blade Runner. But they didn't. Not with the snap. Or Mad Max. You know, that's a, that's a, you know, let's look forward to that one. That's good. Um, this doesn't have the one on it that I think we're probably aiming towards most immediately, which is Children of Men, if anybody's seen that. It's a horrifying vision of the very few in the Um But that's not where I want to end up. I want to end up somewhere down here. Not that one. It's not a very good touch here. It's not a spectrum. I don't know why he's done it like this. Anyway, something like that. Because you've got to know where you're going. What are we actually building towards? And Oscar Wilde apparently said, map the world that does not include the Tokyo is not one thing for glancing at. And we have to have these ideas of where we actually want to go to, what are the ideas that are going to make a better world, and why? Why should people be excited about this stuff? Certainly on the progressive side of politics, we completely fail on vision. Why should people want to be you know, joining together with other countries in the Greater Union? Why should people want to be supporting the poor and things like that? We haven't solved that for a very long time. Um, but I think there's some really exciting ideas that we can start to start with. We can create a vision of the future that involves all of these interesting ideas, not to mention AI in commercial space like biomedical and genome sequencing. I think the stuff that's going to fundamentally change our world in the next 20 years. And we can create a vision of the future where all that works for everywhere. And that's really important. Rather than a future that's built with fences, walls, and hands. So we have to start building that vision. We have to have something new to offer for a hopeful future. But we're a pretty adaptable species, and I think we can do it. Um, but it will take time because we're not used to thinking this way. The only people who presented vision for the future over the last, or at least vision of some kind, over the last few years in politics are Brexit, we we'll take that control. That's a hell of a powerful. And make America great. Right? Speaks to you very, very, very well. So we have to have some kind of obviously this is all you know, they all disagree with me. But on the on the progressive side of things speaking myself, we have to have some kind of vision. And, and we have to start working together. Whether it's in new parties, whether it's trade unions, whether it's other institutions, we have to start working together to build that. So that's something new, that's hopefully a bit of the future of democracy. Um, and and I think now we're going to have a break. Do you want to have a minute break and get back to the 9 o'clock if you want to get a drink? Thank you.